Hi, it's Mr. Bennett, and in this video what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about population ecology. Now when I say the word population, probably the first thing that comes into your mind is how big is a town? Like the population of Logan is 48,000. Population of Nibley is 5,900. If you go to certain places in Wyoming, you can find some extreme examples. This is Buford, Wyoming. It's over by Laramie. And you can see this is legit. Population 1. There's one person in the whole town. person owns this gas station. They runs this gas station. They got it redesignated a town. Now, that does apply. How big a town is, that is one application of the idea of the population. But in a biology class, we're going to take and we're going to stretch that idea of a population and what a population is and make it a little bit more expansive. So what is a population? A population, definition of a population, is it's a group of individuals of a single species that live in the same general area. So for your understanding of what a population is, the population of a town fits this definition. We're talking about the population of Logan. We're talking about a group of humans that live in one area, Logan, Utah. So that would be an example of a population. But we also stretch the idea of a population to plants and animals out in nature as well. Why do we need to do this? Why do we care about populations? Why do we care about groups that live in different areas? Well, let me give you an example. Here are two black bears. These are both the same species of bear. Okay, These two bears here, if they weren't dead, they could mate and they could have children together. Now, you can see that they're obviously different from each other. Big thing we got going on here is size. Now, this one over here, you may think it's a baby. It's not. This bear over here is 100% full grown. This bear over here is 100% full grown. What's the difference between the two? Where they live. This is the size of a full-grown black bear in Washington State. A full-grown black bear in Washington State weighs 125, at max, 150 pounds. This is a full-grown black bear that lives in Alaska. So you can see that as the reason why we care about a population and why we care about individuals of a species, where individuals of a species live, is it can have profound effects on the species. Full-grown bear in Washington, 150 pounds. They're the size of a big dog. If one of these things charges you, you grab a stick and you beat him. A full-grown bear in Alaska, 800 pounds. If he charges you, you crap your pants because you know he's going to eat you. And so this is why we care about populations because where a species live, even if it's the same species, can lead to big differences in the individuals. So when we study a population, there's some major characteristics of a population that we're interested in. And the three major characteristics of population, we'll go through and we'll talk about these more in depth, but the three main characteristics of population we look at when we study it are its geographic distribution, where on the planet it lives. We also study its population density, how many individuals are living in a given space, and we talk about its population growth rate. So we're going to talk about geographic distribution and popu population density real quickly, and then we'll dive into population growth rate and talk a lot more about that one. So the first major characteristic of a population we need to talk about is let's talk about geographic di distribution. Other term for this is range. You'll hear the term range probably more than you'll hear geographic distribution. Simple idea. Where in the world do you find this species? Where in the world do you find penguins? Well, you know it's not in the desert. Where in the world do you find camels? Well, you know it's not in Greenland because the range of that species doesn't extend to those areas. The range of a species is where a species can live. What's its habitat? What's its home? So on and so forth. An example of this is let's talk about deer for a second. In the United States we have three different types of deer. We have black-tailed deer, we have white-tailed deer down here, and then we have mule deer down here. Now if you've only ever been hunting in Utah, you've only ever seen mule deer because if you look at this map here, this map shows you the range of mule deer in the United States and you can see that we have mule deer here in Utah. If you look at the range of white-tailed deer in the United States, you can see white-tails do not live in Utah. Habitat, habitat here just does not work out for them. And so by looking at a map real quickly, we can tell where we can expect to find certain species. If someone tells you they went deer hunting in Indiana, and they shot a mule deer, they're a liar. They don't live there. Likewise, if someone told you they went deer hunting in Utah and they shot a white-tailed deer, they're a liar as well. And you know that based on looking the range. Now the reason why we care about the range of a species is this gives us an idea of what might happen to the population of a species. Let's say you have a massive fire in the western United States. We can expect mule deer populations to be hurt by that. White-tailed deer, on the other hand, aren't going to be affected by it near as much because white-tailed deer mainly live in the eastern United States. 
So the range is where on the earth you can find a species, and the reason why we care about it is it gives us an idea of what's going to happen to a population based on the climate and so forth of that area. Next big idea about populations we need to talk about is we need to talk about population density. Now density is a measurement of how much of something is in a space, how much of something is in a space. So when we're talking about population density, what we're talking about is how many individuals of a population live in a given area. This picture up here, this shows you the population density of the United States for humans. Each of the numbers here shows you how many people live in one square mile in that state. So Utah, in, for every square mile in the state of Utah, there are 33.6 people. You contrast that to Wyoming, for every square mile in Wyoming, there's 5.8 people. Now anyone who's ever been to Wyoming knows this is true. There's a lot fewer people in Wyoming than there are in Utah, even though Wyoming's a little bit bigger state. Come and look at some of the other states. California, 239.1 people for every square mile in California. Come over here and look at New Jersey, 1,195 people per square mile. And if you've ever been back to the East Coast, you know the cities back there are huge and there's lots of people living in them. So that's population density. Population density is just a measurement of how many of a species live in a given area. So some examples of that, we already talked about it, people per square mile. When we talk about the population density of humans, we talk about how many people live in a square mile of that area. We can talk about plants, where we can talk about how many plants are growing in a square foot of land. Here you got a biologist measuring grass out in the wild. And what she's looking at here is how many plants are growing in this square area. She's measuring the density of the plants. You can even take it down. You can look at things like bacteria. You can look at how many bacteria are growing in a square millimeter. These are petri dishes. In each one of the dots you can see here, this is a bacteria colony. There's about a million bacteria in each one of these dots. And so you can see the difference in population density of bacteria between the different petri dishes. So that's population density for you. How many, of a, how many individuals of a given species live in an area? So we've talked about two of the three main characteristics of a population that we study when we look at a population. Now it's time to talk about the third one, and this is what we'll spend the rest of the video on. The third characteristic we look at for a population is what's happening to its size. Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it staying the same? What you can see right here is this is the population oh, history of Logan going back to 1870. Back in 1870, the population of Logan was 1,757 people. In 1980, when I was born, the population of Logan was 26,000 people. And then in 2010, the population of Logan was 48,000 people. In my lifetime, the population of Logan has almost doubled. And so when we look at the population of Logan, we can clearly see that it is growing and it's starting to grow faster and faster. So when we look at a population, we look, is it growing, is it shrinking, is it staying the same? And then we ask ourselves, why is that population growing? Why is it shrinking or why is it staying the same size? Well, what it comes down to is there are four main factors that affect whether a population grows or not. And if you think about this for a second, you should be able to figure it out. What would make it so you have more people in an area? Well, the obvious first answer is going to be birth rate. When you look at a population, and if you want to understand if it's growing or it's shrinking, you look at its birth rate. How many births are there per a given species? So when we're talking about the birth rate of people, we talk about how many births there are per thousand people. That if you have a thousand people, how many babies do you expect to be born in a year? Here we're looking at an extreme example. Okay, this is a mouse. A mouse, an individual mouse, can have 12 to 14 babies per litter, and one female mouse can have 80 babies in a year. That's a crazy high birth rate, and that allows for the population, for the mouse population, to grow very quickly because they have a very high birth rate. Whereas if you take something like an elephant, an elephant can only, an elephant is pregnant for two years. Two years. Feel sorry for the mama elephants. An elephant that lives to be 60 may have three calves in her life. And so they obviously have a much slower birth rate. So if we want to see if a population is growing or shrinking, the first thing we look at is its birth rate. Second thing we look at is we look at its death rate. If you have more people being born than are dying, then the population is going to go up. If you have more people dying than are being born, population is going to go down. Here, this picture, you may recognize this from one of your quizzes. These are dead cicadas. The cicadas are an insect that they lay in the ground for 17 years, and every 17 years they come out, 
they quickly mate, they lay their eggs, and then they die. And so they have a massive death rate. Bunches of them die all at once. And so the population of the cicadas goes up, and then they all die off, and then it drops right back down because they have a massive death rate. So if you want to look if a population is going up or down, you compare the birth rate or the death rate. But that's not the whole story. The other thing that can make it so a popula population can change is its immigration rate and its emigration rate. Now these are two terms that can be pretty easy to, to get mixed up. Let me help you understand it. Immigration means you're moving to a place. Emigration means you're moving from a place. How I remember it, I for in, E for exit. So last summer when I accepted the job at Logan, I was living in Washington. We moved from Washington to Utah. So I immigrated to Utah. I emigrated from Washington. Now this can have a major effect on the size of a population. If you have a bunch of people moving into an area, the population is going to go up. Even if you have a low birth rate or a high death rate, if you have a bunch of people moving in, the population is going to go up. If you have a high emigration rate out of an area, population is going to go down. If you have a bunch of people that are leaving an area, population is going to go down. So these are the four things that determine if a population is going to grow or not. You have to look at its birth rate, its death rate, its immigration rate, and its emigration rate. The only way a population can grow is if its birth rate and its death rate, com I mean, its birth rate and its immigration rate combined are larger than its death rate and its emigration rate combined. So when we talk about population growth, there are really two ways that a population can grow, or two grow, or two patterns that a population will follow as it grows. The first one we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about exponential growth. Exponential growth is when a population starts out small and then just takes off like a rocket and grows really, really, really quickly, producing lots of individuals in a short amount of time. An example of a species that can do exponential growth are bacteria. Now as you can see in this video how bacteria divide is they start out with one cell and that one cell divides and becomes two. And then those two cells divide and become four, four becomes eight, eight becomes sixteen, sixteen becomes thirty-two, thirty-two to sixty-four, and they grow really, really quickly. All these bacteria that you can see down here all started out from just two bacteria. So that's an example of exponential growth. You start out with two bacteria, 2 to 4, 4 to 8, 8 to 16, and next thing you know you're creating thousands and millions and billions of bacteria. That's an example of exponential growth. Our other example or our other pattern of population growth is logistical growth. And logistical growth happens when a population can grow rapidly for a while and then it either levels off or else the population grows rapidly and then crashes and then grows rapidly again and then goes cr and then crashes. This is what we call logistical growth. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go through and we're going to talk about each of these types of growth a little bit more in depth. All right, so let's talk about exponential growth first. Exponential growth happens when a population constantly grows. If a population is always growing, even if it's by just a small bit, if a population is just growing by half a percent, exponential growth will happen. But the population may start out growing slow, but if it keeps growing and it never goes down, that population is just going to take off like a rocket. Now, what needs to happen for exponential growth to occur is that you need to have a birth rate that is always higher than your death rate. If your birth rate is always higher than your death rate, exponential growth will happen. Now, here's an example of exponential growth. These are grasshoppers in Africa, and this actually happened just this year. The Africa had a major grasshopper or a locust outbreak over there. Now what happened is they had a huge rainstorm that made a, so a lot of grass grew. Lots of grass meant lots of food. Lots of food meant that the grasshopper population could take off. And so for a while the grasshopper population started out small and then it took off like crazy because there was so much food that was available to it. And this brings our second point about exponential growth. In order for a species to do exponential growth, it needs to have basically unlimited food, water, and resources. There needs to be more food and water there than the species can possibly eat and drink. If there's more food there than the species can eat, all the species can keep having babies until eventually your birth rate is so high the population just explodes and gets really, really high really, really quickly. So I gave you one example that can make a population grow exponentially. 
Let's talk about some other examples of things that can make it so a population can grow exponentially. That even big, slow reproducing animals like an elephant, their population can grow exponentially. I told you that an elephant is pregnant for two years. A 60-year-old elephant will have maybe three calves in her lifetime. But here you can see on this graph that this is a population of elephants in Africa that clearly experienced exponential growth. In the early 1900s, there was almost no back, there was almost no elephants in this area. And then starting in about the 1940s, the population started to grow. And then the 60s, it really took off like crazy. Well, what made it so these elephants that reproduce so slowly could grow exponentially? Well, what happens is if you change the environment and you make the environment better, that can make a population grow exponentially. And how you can make a population better is by giving them more food, making it so they have less predators, or make it so they have a better climate. You make any of these changes to an environment, a population can grow exponentially. What made it so that the elephants could grow so quickly? This right here, we're looking at the country of South Africa down here, and this right up here is this is Kruger National Park. And in the 1940s, they established Kruger National Park to be a place where elephants could be protected because they were having major problems with poachers who were shooting all the elephants for their ivory. And so they established Kruger National Park in the 40s, and they were serious about it. Kruger National Park is patrolled by the military, and if they find a poacher, they don't arrest him. They shoot him dead on spot. And so as a result of that, poaching of the elephants went way down, and that allowed the population of the elephants to grow really, really quickly. And this is just one example of how if you change the environment and make it more beneficial for the species, the spe any species can grow exponentially, even slow reproducing one, if the climate and the environment is right for them. So exponential growth is when a species grows very, very quickly. But here's the thing about exponential growth. It only happens for a short period of time. Exponential growth can only happen for a short period of time. No population can grow exponentially forever. That is a hard and fast rule, and there are no exceptions to that. Earlier, I showed you the picture of all the grasshoppers in Africa. Well, about two weeks after that picture was taken, there was a whole bunch of pictures like this that were taken. Lots of dead grasshoppers everywhere. Now, what's the reason for this? I told you that exponential growth happens when a species has more food and water than they can take advantage of. Well, eventually the population gets so big, they start running out of food and water, and everybody dies off. When that happens, something happens that we call logistical growth. And logistical growth is what happens to a population after they're done with the, their exponential growth. So this would be kind of what happened to the grasshopper population. The grasshopper population grew and grew and grew and grew until eventually the population got so big that there wasn't enough food for everybody. And then we start seeing the population go down as a result of the grasshopper population running out of food and water. Now, this line we have up here is called carrying capacity. What's carrying capacity? Carrying capacity is the maximum number of organisms that can live in an area for a year long term. So if we're talking about carrying capacity, it'd be things like how many deer can live in a forest, how many flies can live in this room, things like that is what we're looking at. And the carrying capacity is how many resources are in an area to support a population. So let's say a thousand deer can live in Logan Canyon. The carrying capacity of Logan Canyon is a thousand deer. What that's telling you is if less than a thousand deer live in Logan Canyon, the population has room to grow. But if the population of deer in Logan Canyon is more than a thousand deer, there's not going to be enough food, water, and resources for all those deer, and someone's got to die. Someone's going to starve to death. So carrying capacity is really what limits how big a population can get. A population can grow until it hits its carrying capacity, and carrying capacity is the point at which a population starts running out of food and water. And as a result of that, some people are going to starve to death, and there's going to be some death, which is going to bring the population back down. When the population starts to go down, now what we're talking about is logistical growth. So a population can grow until it reaches its carrying capacity, and a population can even go over its carrying capacity, but once a population goes over its carrying capacity, you're going to have a die-off. There's going to be a die-off, and the population is going to shrink for a while. So here what we're looking at is this blue line is this represents the carrying capacity of a species or a population. This red line represents the actual population. 
you can see that here for a while this population was actually above its carrying capacity. But eventually what happened is things started to run out of food and water and the population shrank as individuals started to die. Then once the population got underneath its carrying capacity, now the population has room to grow because there's more food and water around than the population is using. So that allows the population to grow for a bit until it goes over its carrying capacity and then it drops again. And this logistical growth is how most species are growing. As most species are constantly going above their carrying capacity, dying off, going underneath it again, and then above and then underneath as they're constantly having lots of babies and then lots of things are dying off. Now, what makes it so a species overshoots its carrying capacity? Here's the thing about carrying capacity. Carrying capacity does not stay the same from year to year. What you're looking at here is the population growth of rabbits and foxes. Now, foxes eat rabbits. And so the carrying capacity of the fox is going to depend a lot on how many rabbits are around for them to eat. Well, you can see in this graph that the population of the rabbits goes up and it goes down on about a seven-year cycle. About every seven years, the population of the rabbits peaks, and then seven years later, it craters, and then peaks, and then it craters. And so what happens for the fox is in this year right here, the carrying capacity of the fox is going to be really high because there's lots of rabbits for him to eat. And this year down here, the carrying capacity of the, rat, of the fox is going to suck because there's almost no food for them to eat. And if you look at the fox population, what happens is whenever the rabbit population goes up, the fox population goes up with it because its carrying capacity is going up. Whenever the population of the rabbits goes down, Shortly thereafter, the population of the fox goes down because its carrying capacity is going down with it. And so this can be one of the reasons why a population can overshoot its carrying capacity is because its carrying capacity is not going to be the same from one year to the next.